Great. Well, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, so I picked for my topic um, bill of materials. And ordinarily, these are insanely boring. But I'm going to see if I can make them interesting and let you know all the cool things you can do if you've got a really solid, uh, solid bomb. So before I get started, I always love to just get a feel for who's in the audience. So by a show of hands, and this is going to be a little bit hardware-centric, who's built a working prototype of, of anything? It can be Arduino, 3D printed. Nice. Not too surprising. Uh, has anybody built 100 units of anything? OK, a few. Can I get 1,000? Sweet. All right. Cool. So you've got a feel for what it um, is like to go from one to many. And it's definitely a really different part of the journey than just going from zero to one. So we're going to focus tonight on the, the one to many. So one to maybe 1,000, maybe 100,000, a million. Um, just a quick overview of how we got started doing what we're doing. Uh, I had the privilege of being at iRobot for 10 years during the early years, uh, and my job was take, to take the Roomba from a working prototype and then figure out how to build a lot of them, so the, the one to many. Um, we built about 4 million of them and did this in the early 2000s, so it was kind of the dark ages compared to what we have today. Uh, what we do now is help amazing hardware companies of all sizes go from the working prototype to high volume. And we do this through our software, uh, through our team, and through our network. And we've done it for a couple hundred companies, so we've built up a, a proven process. Um, so I thought, you know, why is manufacturing hard? Uh, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. So what we're going to do here is run down the Roomba line in 2005, and uh, you'll get a feel for what it looks like. So what you're going to see here is about 1,200 workers um, building the Roomba. You'll notice it's a lot of manual work. Um, of course, um, they're halfway across the world. None of them speak English. Uh, different time zone, different culture. So imagine sort of the challenge of taking an idea that you've built with, say, just five people uh, of similar educational background in the same room and uh, not even got it stable, but got it good enough to start production and then ramping up to that, that volume. Uh, and this is actually only one of four lines. So there's other three identical lines like this where we could build roughly 40,000 Roombas a week. So enough Roombas to fill this whole room. Um, so that's sort of a glimpse on some of the, you know, why manufacturing might be hard. When we think about how to make this simpler, we try to break it down into basic principles. And for us, this is the, uh, the manufacturing triangle, which uh, breaks down to cost, quality, and schedule. So what you want to do is control all three of these. And uh, as it turns out, they are all very directly tied to your bill of materials, which is why this thing is so important. So we, uh, we have a lot of companies come to us, and uh, they're of all different sizes. But some of the commonalities are that they're starting with one and working their way up to millions. So this isn't the apples of the world. Um, these are companies like American Kennel Club or Anheuser-Busch or Pebble. You know, take your pick. And pretty much everybody starts on the left there, building that one prototype and then figuring out how to build 10, which is maybe 3D printing, and then 100, which might be CNCing, and then 1,000, um, you know, which is maybe soft tooling and so on. But you've got to work through the different steps. The one thing that's common across all of these steps is a bill of material, which is really the foundation. Um, and like with any good house, you want to have a solid foundation under you because that lets you grow really quickly. If your foundation is shaky, it's really, really difficult to scale. So, you know, what is the bill of materials? Well, it's basically just a really precise list of all the ingredients that go into building your product. And it's both electrical and mechanical. It's not uh, one or the other, but to build the product, you need, you need everything. Um, so when we think of it, and I apologize for doing this near dinner time if you haven't had dinner, we often use the analogy of a hamburger. So with the hamburger, there's different components. You've got some fabricated parts, which um, in a product, you know, maybe are your injection molded housings. You've got some purchase parts, which are like screws and springs. You've got your printed circuit board or your PCB. You've got the components that go on it, which are your um, electrical components, and then your packaging. That makes up the burger, similar to the buns, the lettuce, the tomato, and so on. But when you buy a burger, they don't just hand you a greasy burger across the counter. You actually have to have it packaged. And this is one of the things that we find a lot of uh, customers forget, uh, because it has a lead time and it costs money. So you're going to want to make sure that you capture that in your bill of materials. 
and you also may want to build up this concept of a skew. So I like to use a Roomba as an example because most people know what it is. You could imagine having a robot and then a virtual wall and a charger and a packaging for one, um, one channel like uh, Costco. And then for another one like Sam's Club because you can't have apples and apples, you have two virtual walls and three robots or something like that. So being able to keep track of all those at a higher meta level is really important. Um, so you do this in the BOM, and if you've got a good BOM, it enables you to do all these other really interesting things, which are definitely sexy. So um, the one I'm going to focus on here for the time we have is the cash flow analysis, because not dying is really cool. Um, and so often we find the companies will run out of money, um, which is bad, but then they'll be surprised by the fact that they ran out of money, which is even worse. Because often if you make the decisions right up front, you can avoid these disasters. Um, but you can also make sure that you maintain your IP. So often you're going so fast that you're giving more and more control to the factory. And with any partner, even a great factory, you want to make sure that you hold your own databases. So if you have to switch to another factory, you can go and do that. The bomb will let you do that. Um, so protecting the IP is super important. You can understand your schedule. So as we'll talk about, many components have long lead times, which for consumer electronics is incredibly important to keep track of. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting things you can do. And of course you can calculate your cost of goods sold, which as a preview is a lot more than just adding up column F in your spreadsheet. Um, if you don't know your COGS, then it's very difficult to make sure you're making money. But it all starts with the bomb. So three key concepts that are often not clear in spreadsheets. Number one is what we call the minimum order quantity, and, uh, or MOQ, and probably the best way to describe this is, let's say you wanted to drink five beers, which would be a fun thing to do. It's probably cheaper to buy a six pack, but you're gonna have one beer left over, and you still have to pay for that. Um, so it's important to have a way to account for that so that you make sure you have enough uh, uh, money to cover it. The reason you'd want to buy a six pack is, of course, it's cheaper to buy a pack of six than it is to buy six individual beers. So that's the idea of the MLQ. As it uh, relates to electrical components, when you're building in volume, you're probably going to buy reels of capacitors, say, in 5,000 units. That's just how many they put in a reel. But if you're only building 3,000 um, parts of your product, you still have to account for the other 2K. So that's one thing that bites a lot of companies. The second is the idea of lead time. So when you're building your prototype, you're going from zero to one, you know, often you just order whatever you want from DigiKey and it arrives the next day and things are great. When you're building in volume, that thing that you could get overnight is likely going to take 12 weeks before it arrives in the factory. And if you haven't accounted for this and are trying to hit the holiday season, then that can be super disappointing um, because you're going to be 12 weeks late at least. So for all of your components, you've got to keep track of what your lead time looks like. Uh, third thing is procurement, and this gets to the uh, stability of your supply chain. So you can imagine that you probably need all of the parts in your bill of materials to build the product. If you have one that is unavailable, maybe Apple sucks it all up because they need it or it's been end of life or things like that, you're in a whole world of pain, especially because if we think of the triangle, one of the key things is schedule, and in consumer electronics, you can't be late. So to make your... Uh, product robust, your supply chain robust, you often may want to do like approved vendor list where you qualify five vendors for each component. So if one goes away, you can um, get the other ones. You may want to consign a component to protect the IP of your product, uh, things like that. And those are all called out in your bomb. So let's say we've gone and created a bomb. It's a hierarchical bomb so we can keep track of our SKUs. We've got all this information. What are some cool things we can do with it? Well, as I said, like not dying is a really fun thing. So what I've got here is uh, just a picture of some software we built at Dragon that lets you manage your bill of materials in a hierarchical format. Um, so you'll see there's some uh, indented information and just a complete description of every part you're building. Go ahead and create that. We're going to run a cash flow analysis. Uh, so what I've got here is week one is where we pick our factory. Weeks go that way. Uh, payments that you have to write to the factory are yellow bars coming down. And then uh, you can see like maybe I have to pay 50% of my tooling up front, and then I have to pay 80% of my component cost 12 weeks out, and then when I finally take delivery of the product, I have to pay the rest of it. Um, so plotting that out. Next thing is revenue, which is the good stuff. Um, so this is when you finally get paid for your product. 
And you can imagine if you do a diff between the two of them, you'll get working capital. So what this is telling me is that if I don't have that amount of money, I don't have enough money to build my product. And the joy is I can figure this out well before I'm dead um, so that I can make changes. It also tells me here, because the gray is above the, um, above the high water mark, that I'm actually making money for every product I sell. So often we run these analyses and we find the gray is underwater. And that means, for every, that means that you're losing money. And that could be for one of two reasons. One is that you're selling a product for uh, less than it costs you to make it. So the more you sell, the more bankrupt you go. The other one is maybe you just have expensive tooling. And um, in that case, you'd want to sell as many as you can to amortize the cost of the tooling. But of course, it's, you know, it's polar opposite. You've got to understand what it means. So let's just run a simple example here in the, in the time we have left. So I'm going to assume I have to pay 100% of the components to the factory when they order them. So this is effectively, if I have a 12-week lead time component, I have to pay 12 weeks up front. Uh, my terms with the factory are the CM are zero. So whenever I take delivery of the product, I have to pay them. I'm going to, um, my customer is going to pay me net 30, meaning after they receive the product, they pay me 30 days later, and then I'm going to sea ship it, so it's nominally five weeks on the water. Now, let's say that's not good enough. I want to make it better. So what I've done now, you can see at the top, is gone from 100% upfront payment to the factory to only um, paying uh, when I receive it. And that hasn't changed the amount of working capital I need, but you'll see it has deployed my capital for a lot less, uh, a lot shorter period. So that's much better, but it's not quite good enough. So let's see if we can make it even better than that. So now let's say that I can negotiate net 30 days with my factory. So instead of paying when I take delivery of the product, I'm going to pay them 30 days later. Now this one makes a big difference. This is going to save me uh, $130,000 right there. And again, I haven't changed the design. I've just negotiated better terms, because you'll see that gray is coming up. But that's still not good enough, so let's make it a little bit better. Um, so what I'm going to do here is negotiate better terms for me with my customer. Let's say I've got a hot product like the Roomba, and I'm not going to get paid 30 days later. I'm going to get paid when they receive it. That makes a huge difference. It brings me from uh, 414K to under 100K. And again, no design changes. And then if we um, say you're building a small product like the clicker here, the contain containerization is really good um, and air shipping is not going to be so bad. So I can even lop off a little bit more time taking my five week shipping um, down to two weeks. So just as a recap, we went from this, uh, which is kind of a grim picture, to that, which is a much happier picture. And again, through no design uh, changes. So of course it depends if you can negotiate that stuff with the factory and with your customer, but just being aware of it ahead of time and having a good bill of materials with accurate MOQs and lead times definitely sets you up to succeed because really the decisions you make early are the ones that are gonna haunt you or reward you six months from now when it's too late to change it. Um, so you know, a few uh, takeaways. Um, hopefully I've been able to show you how important a bill of materials is. And again, it's not the most fun thing to do in the world. Um, we've tried to make some software to help you um, do it a lot more easily than you can in an Excel spreadsheet. Whatever method you use, definitely having good bomb hygiene is going to pay dividends uh, in the future, especially when you're getting ready to, uh, to scale. It's essential to understand the triangle. So you know, what are your cost of goods sold? How much money do you need to run your business? When are you going to be able to deliver from the schedule? And then what's an appropriate quality level? Um, those are all things you want to set up ahead of time. And uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much what I have. If you um, would like some additional resources, including the software to do this, or uh, we do a lot of talks on injection molding or die casting or how to pick a factory, um, all the resources is there. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd, I'd love to field them. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so just for context and uh, to give you uh, an opportunity for a commercial plug, so do, do you want to tell people about Dragon a little bit? How, how does a startup building a product engage with you guys? Sure. So what we do is love to really get in early with amazing hardware companies of all sizes and just help them work through this stuff because, again, these decisions are so critical into being able to scale once you're ready to pour um, you know, gasoline on the fire. 
so we can help think through this, um, you know, help you pick a great factory. So you've got a really trusted partner um, that will be with you all the way, and then really dive deep into each point of the triangle. So understand the cost of goods sold. It gets a little bit trickier than I um, specified when you get into like volume step pricing or trying to pick out which supplier you want to get. We can help you with that. Design for manufacture and assembly, comprehensive quality plans, because that's uh, something everybody forgets or leaves till the end, and then they're faced with the challenge of wow, Christmas is coming, it's already October, I haven't had time to test this, should I ship it or not? We can try to keep you out of that situation so you're well prepared. Um, but yeah, pretty much just going through um, the process of you've got a prototype, how do you get into high volume production and survive? We can help you with that. Great. And you have a bunch of people on the ground in China, right? We do, yeah. We've got about 10 in Boston and 20 in China. And um, yeah, we've been really fortunate to work with uh, several hundred companies to help them. Great. Uh, do we have questions? Just one here and then the next one. Hi. Thanks for your uh, talk. Very interesting. How did you get paid? Oh, sure. So um, right now the software we have is free. Eventually we'll start charging for it on a SaaS model. Um, so that's one line of revenue. And then we also, for companies that need more help, basically just work on a monthly basis. So um, the alternative would be hiring a VP of operations, and there's many great VP of ops there, but usually you just get one person where, you know, if you said, Scott, I need you to be in a factory in southern China in half an hour, I could do that with a trusted person and, um, and help navigate you uh, through it. So it, think of it like a monthly subscription um, as well on top of that for people. Great question over there. Hi. Um, so you spoke about uh, IP a little bit, uh, and so now you have something getting developed like you said, on the other side of the world. How do you uh, protect these dozens of factories who are looking at your designs and product from knocking it off and selling it to other people? Oh, that's an awesome question. So it's basically how do you protect your IP and not get knocked off? And there's a couple ways you can do that. One is working with great factories, um, so being able to figure out who the good ones are. Um, two is in the factory selection process, we call it the RFQ or the RFQ uh, request for quote, you want to disclose enough information that they know what you're building, but not so much that you put your IP at risk. And then once you're building the product, there's um, two important axes to look at it. One is a systems approach. So any product is going to have electrical, mechanical, and software. Mechanical you can't protect, pretty much, especially when it's in the market. Any competent engineer can knock it off. Electrical is a little bit harder. If you're paranoid, you could take the silk screen off the components, but they can always figure it out and x-ray your boards to figure out your traces. The thing you want to protect is your software. So, and this goes actually back to the bills on material. There's one category of components called consigned, and typically we'd say for your processor, where obviously you can't build a product without the processor, you want to consign that. And what that means is you buy that yourself, Say I'm buying an um, arm from um, Arrow. I send it to a company like Arrow where they squirt in the bootloader in a secure environment and then give it to the factory. And the reason that's so important is one, I always own the IP and don't risk losing the bootloader. But two, it protects against a ghost shift. So the ghost shift is where they build your product in the day and then they build your product in the night, but it doesn't go to you. So like sneakers are almost impossible to protect because you're going to be competing with your own. But if you give them a thousand processors, you know they can only build a thousand units minus scrap. Um, and so that's one way to slice it. The other way is in a factory, there's three levels. There's the boss, the manager, engineering manager, and the worker. The workers don't see it soon enough to be a threat. It's going to be in market. The boss will never rip you off because they probably work with a lot bigger companies and that would be devastating. It's the engineering manager who makes $500 a month that you have to protect against somebody giving him $1,000, him or her a thousand bucks for a thumb drive. And the way we do that is just always having feet in the ground, um, vetting um, the factories, uh, secure rooms and um, good uh, IP hygiene. And of all the companies we've worked with, we've never lost any, any IP. Not to say, it, I mean, it's, it's all about risk management. The tighter you go, the slower you're going to go. So the best thing you can do is build up trust. Um, and also, as just bringing it back to the bomb, we see too many companies give too much of the bomb control to their factory. You've got to have that system of record yourself, so you're, you're lighting your feet. But that's an awesome question. Cool. On that note, thank you very much. Cool. Thank you.